Hi everyone and welcome to the 3.01 flipped recording on the first lesson in the chemistry unit. So be sure to take notes during this recording. I'm going to help you answer your guiding questions as well as help you fill in notes on um, the lesson that you can use on your quizzes and tests. So as we go into the lesson, it gives you a unit introduction that talks you through the chemistry unit. So taking a look at a couple of things, and this is not anything you need to put in your notes, but it's talking about the essential question. So it does say you to write this in your science notebook. So you could put this in your notes on 3.01. So think about what you already know about chemical reactions by considering these questions. What are some chemical reactions you observe in your daily life? And two, how does matter change in a chemical reaction? Are the atoms the same or different before and after the reaction? So on the left side of your notebook, draw some diagrams, make notes about your ideas, and ask your own questions about matter. Revisit these as you work through the unit and add notes that answer the questions to the right side. Add drawings and notes about how your ideas changed to the left side. So this is a slide that you could do maybe in front of um, 3.01 to um, kind of set up a little bit of some ideas and things that you're going to be looking at as you work through um, this unit. So next we're looking at chemistry. When you were a child, you may have asked, what's the moon made of? And you may have received the answer, it's made of cheese. You know now that that's not true, but the what is this made of question and many others can be asked uh, about nearly everything you see in life. So there's a video here. It says chemistry is the study of matter and how it behaves. So there's a definition for you to put in your notes. This is a vast field that covers everything that you see and encounter in life. Chemistry is not just for a laboratory, it happens all around you. For example, the electricity that powers your computer is the movement of electrons. You're using chemistry right now and you probably don't even realize it. How can a new cell phone have more memory than older versions and yet be smaller? What makes glow sticks glow? How does your pizza crust get that bubbly, airy texture? Why do fireworks happen so fast while rusting happens so slowly? How is gold separated from mined rock and then turned into jewelry? One word can help answer all of these questions. Chemistry. All right, so there's a preview there of what we'll be looking at. So next thing that you need to do is take a look at the lesson goals. Again, these are not anything that need to be put on your slide. Um, you do have some key words to go ahead and define. So since this is the first lesson in the unit, you can go ahead and open a new template slide. Okay, and remember in doing that, you're gonna wanna change um, these things up here to get you started. So enable editing. I always forget that part. So every time, very easy to do this one. Physical science unit name. So this would be unit three chemistry. And then you can leave this one blank for now because you will want to go ahead and duplicate it couple of times so that you're set up for lessons to come and then go back up here and change this to 3.01 chemistry. Okay, so you'll be updating. Go ahead and put some definitions there just as you have done in the other lessons. So that will be your PowerPoint for unit three. You're going to want to put in covalent bond. That's a bond in which the electrons are shared between the bonded atoms. So they're shared like a covenant, something shared together. You can think of that. Ionic bond, 
is the force of attraction between a charged atom or a group of connected atoms and another with the opposite charge. So it's a little hard to remember that one. I always remember the word covalent, kind of like covenant shared, um, and then ionic. Here, this one, you've got opposite charges. Okay, so um, the last one, valence electrons, you know um, those electrons are in the outermost shell. Okay, so from there, we're going on to guiding questions. As you know, we're very important. So what I like to do is um, as I'm going through, I'm going to minimize that. I um, just take a little snip of these. You guys could put them um, right into your PowerPoint, but then you can't really edit it. So I put it on a Word document. Oh, got to copy it. And I'm using the um, Light Shot tool in Microsoft the Office Windows 10. Um, that's a little purple feather, and it lets me take that little snip of the screen. So I go back into, sorry, the Word document and paste that in. I just move it over to the side to help answer those questions as we go through the lesson. So first thing we're going to be looking for is what do the properties of any substance depend on? And that will pretty much get us through the introduction. And now we're getting into the lesson content. So properties, a cotton dish towel and a potato are made from the same atoms. So what makes them different substances? The properties of a substance, of any substance, depend on the arrangement and types of atoms that are bonded together. Take water, for example. In a water molecule, H2O, you have two hydrogen atoms form bonds with one oxygen atom. The properties of water are very different properties from the properties of either hydrogen by itself or oxygen by itself. So for example, hydrogen and oxygen are both gases at room temperature, but water is a liquid. So when two substances come together to make a new substance with a different properties, we call that a chemical change. And we saw a little bit of this in unit two. And so there are different ways for atoms to bond to one another. So going back really quickly, I would go ahead and um, make sure you have this in your notes if you need it. Two substances come together to make a new substance. That's a chemical change. Um, two ways for atoms to bond to one another. The type of bond atoms form also affects the properties of a substance. Okay, so chemical bonding. Have you ever thought about what makes up salt? Does salt have the same properties as its elements? Ordinary table salt is a compound called sodium chloride and its chemical formula is NaCl. NaCl is composed of one atom of sodium for every atom of chlorine. These atoms bond together to form salt. The bond is the force of attraction between one atom and another atom. So here's another definition for your notes. When new bonds are formed, we call this a chemical change. You may want to add that in as well. So the properties of table salt are much different than those of sodium and chloride individually, or chlorine. So for example, chlorine is a gas, and when table salt, while well, table salt we know is a solid. If you tried to eat metallic sodium, you could die, but we know that table salt is safe to eat. So if we take a look, amazing properties, Sodium is a metal that vigorously reacts with water. It can even start a fire on water when the hydrogen released by its reaction with water ignites. Chlorine is a poisonous gas that we use or that was used as a weapon in World War I. All right, so electrons in bonding. Atoms combine to form stable electron arrangements. A stable arrangement is one that does not change easily. If atoms exist in unstable arrangement, they tend to rearrange to a more stable arrangement. For most elements, the most stable arrangement is eight outer shell electrons. I would put that in your notes. The most um, stable arrangement is an eight outer electrons. Okay. The valence electrons, we got that word earlier, of an atom are the electrons in its outermost shell. 
So study the example of sodium and chlorine again. How could these atoms most easily have eight valence electrons? For sodium to achieve its most stable configuration, it must lose one valence electron so that the shell with eight electrons becomes its outermost shell. For chlorine to achieve its most stable configuration, it must gain one electron to have eight valence electrons. So when these two atoms are near each other, sodium is going to lose one electron in its outer shell to chlorine. So this way, sodium and chlorine will have both eight valence electrons. All right, so it is important to note, and you may want to put this example in your notes. And one thing um, that you might want to have handy is your periodic table as you go through, um, because it'll start to see patterns on um, the outer shell electrons. And so we can see that sodium is in A, it's in group one, so we know that it's a plus one. So at the top, we said, um, for sodium to achieve its most stable electron, it must lose one valence electron. So the plus one, they're gonna, that means it's gonna go away. And then chlorine, we know, is in group 17, and it's um, a minus one charge. So that means it's got to um, gain one electron to have eight valence electrons. So you can see in the example, sodium only has one here. So it's gonna give it away and it's going to um, bond with chlorine to complete that valence shell to eight. So once those are bonded together, they will share those electrons. Okay, next, ionic bonds and ionic compounds. So when an atom gains or loses one or more electrons, an ion is formed. So that is something you want to include in your notes. An ion has a charge. A sodium ion is Na plus, and a chloride ion is a Cl minus. The plus sign tells you that sodium ions have lost one electron. So that's what I was mentioning earlier on um, the group one elements. They um, have the little plus sign by them, so they're going to lose that electron. And the minus sign tells you that the chlorine atoms have gained one electron. And I know that sounds opposite, so you may want to make yourself a note, but I also um, think it's important to label over the group one uh, electrons. I'm sorry, the group one on your periodic table. If you put a plus one there, you might even write out to the side, gives one away. They lost, they lose an electron. And then over group 17, you want to put a one minus so that you know, and maybe write out to the side, it's going to gain. And so sodium and chlorine form an ionic bond, which is a bond formed when an oppositely charged ions attract. So this bond is formed when one atom transfers electrons to another atom. The resulting product is called an ionic compound. So now we've made a new substance. We've combined atoms to form a molecule, which we're getting a compound now. So table salt is an example of an ionic compound. Ionic bonds occur between one metal and one non-metal. So you want that in your notes as well. It's important to know that. And in the elect I'm sorry, in the example of table salt, sodium is the metal and chlorine is the non-metal. All right, so that's a good example to include in your notes as well. Um, here is just a little note that sodium chloride is widely and abundantly distributed in nature, commonly known as table salt, and it has a very distinctive taste. Salt in your body. So salt is extremely important in the function of the human body. The excretory system controls the balance of ions from salt that dissolves in water and in the body. When salt in the body is dissolved in water, the results are negatively and positively charged ions. These charges allow your body to conduct small electric currents between nerves. Without small amounts of salt, your body could not function properly because nerves will not work correctly. So the function of certain sports drinks is to replace salts that you lose when you sweat. So do you know your chemistry terms? This is a great practice activity to make sure you know the term 
and the definition and also make sure you have those in your notes. So we're still in 3.01. This is still um, places to add um, notes. Covalent bonds. So now this is something, an image you might want to snip and put in your notes as well. Um, you've learned about ionic bonding using table salts as an example, but there's another type of bonding called covalent bonding. And this is the bonding shown between nonmetals. So that's important to put in your notes bonding between nonmetals. So covalent bonds are two nonmetals. Nonmetals tend to gain electrons, so instead of exchanging electrons, they share them. A covalent bond is a bond formed when atoms share one or more pairs of electrons to get eight electrons in their valence shell. So remember, they're trying to fill up that outer shell with eight, and the resulting product is called a molecule. So when a new molecules are formed, this is also considered a chemical change. So that might be a note that you need to add if you don't remember that. And then again, this picture would be helpful to add. It's showing um, two nonmetals and then they're bonding and then they'll be sharing these electrons. Okay, covalent bonds, repulsion and attraction. So have you ever played tug of war? You pull the rope, uh, you pull on the rope to bring your opponent closer to you. And at the same time, your opponent tugs you closer. This idea is helpful when thinking of covalent bonds. So you might want to type outside or write in your notes tug of war example so that you can kind of get that in your head. And let's take a look at hydrogen gas. We know that's H2. Each hydrogen atom consists of one proton and one electron. A proton has a positive charge and an electron has a negative charge. You probably don't need to write that down. You remember it from unit two pretty easily. So when two hydrogen atoms come together, a tug of war begins between electrical forces. The two, electrical, or the two electrons repel each other, but the electron of one atom is still attracted to the proton of another atom. So kind of think about battery ends as well. You have a positive and a negative end there. And so the forces of attraction are stronger than the forces of repulsion. So repulsion means like to push away. If I'm repulsed by something, I don't want it near me. So it's going to be pushed away. So the two atoms form a bond in which the two electrons are shared by the two atoms. So if you look at this image, you're able to see, we know it's hydrogen. It has one proton in the nucleus. So this is a hydrogen atom and this is a hydrogen atom. And then we can see one electron on each outer shell. So you can see that um, the two positives are pushing this way. You can see the negatives are repelling each other going that way because, um, you know, they'll say opposites attract. These are positive, positive, so they're going to push away from each other. Okay, and here's negative, negative, so they're going to push away from each other. So two hydrogen atoms make contact. Particles in one atom attract and repel particles in the other. So you can see that here they're going to pull together a positive and negative, um, but they're going to push away where they are the same. Okay, so a bond forms when forces are balanced. If we look at this picture, you can see again where I was talking about the attraction. So uh, remember, opposites attract, you always hear that saying, and so now you're able to see. Um, where the bonds or the, the protons and the electrons are attracted. So you can add that into your notes as well. So covalent bonds are shared electrons. Look at this diagram. Here you see a model of two separate hydrogen atoms, each represented by an H and each with a single dot on one side. This dot represents a valence electron or the electron in the outer shell. In the second diagram, you see the covalent bond that forms when two atoms meet. The double dots between the atoms represent the shared pair of electrons, and we call two shared electrons a covalent bond. So remember, if you want to put that in your notes again, you can. This is showing you the two separate hydrogen atoms. Each has one valence electron. 
And then when we look at the next picture, now you're showing like a hydrogen H2, hydrogen gas. Um, this is how you would show that covalent bond. They are sharing those electrons to bond. Okay, we're moving into covalently bonded compounds. So let's look about um, at the example about plants. They um, take in carbon dioxide, CO2, and water, H2O. Both are covalently bonded compounds. Through the complex process of photosynthesis, bonds are rearranged to form glucose or sugar and oxygen gas. This is one example in which covalent bonds are important in determining chemical, physical, and biological properties of matter. Have a look around you. You can probably see wood, rubber, water, pottery, your skin, and all of these things are made of covalently bonded compounds. Covalently bonded substances make up most of the substances needed for life to exist. Okay, so as we're going through these, hopefully you're going back. I haven't referenced the guiding questions. Um, question number seven, I'm sorry, number eight. This, this actually answers the last question. So what kind of bond makes up most of the substances needed for life to exist? That's number eight, covalently bonded compounds. Guiding question seven, why do repulsion and attraction take place? during covalent bonding. So that's where you would use your um, positive and negative, those images that I just had you screenshot before in your notes. So you can go back um, from what we've talked about and you should be able to easily fill in um, those guiding questions. And you also see those um, at the end usually as well. There's a couple in the lesson review. So kind of wrapping back up here, ionic versus covalent, it is important to understand the difference. Um, one thing you might want to do is, um, this is practice looking at elements, lithium and bromide. So you've got to, um, you're seeing like lithium is a metal, bromine is a non-metal. So if you remember, we um, talked about a metal and a non-metal is ionic, occurs between a metal and a non-metal. Ionic occurs between two atoms, so we know that both of them occur between two atoms, occur between two nonmetals, that's covalent. Electrons are transferred from one atom to another. That happens in both. Actually, transferred, it happens in ionic because they're shared in covalent. So both use attractive forces to form a chemical bond and result in chemical change. So it says both, so hopefully that gives you a clue. Electrons are shared between two atoms. We know that is covalent. Use the valence shell electrons of two atoms. We know that that happens in both of them. And then a carbon-oxygen bond is an example. Carbon and oxygen are both non-metals. So if you check this and get them all correct, you can screenshot this and put them in your notes as well. So that wraps us up. We have finished the lesson content. If you take a look at the lesson review, you're also able to go through and answer five questions there. Um, that's just gonna help cement some of the stuff we talked about. Um, a dish towel and a potato, so remember that's on the first slide. So just go through and see how well you do on that. Anything you miss, I encourage you to put um, in your notes as something you might potentially see on a quiz. So if you had the question and the correct answer in, that would be really helpful. And then checking your knowledge. We know when atoms bond, new substances are formed. The way atoms bond affects the properties of the new substance. Um, so think about that in the concept in terms of how atoms interact with each other. And then these are usually questions that you can find answers to based on everything we've talked about. The answer is here if you don't know it, um, but it helps you sometimes with the guiding questions are very similar. So that wraps up the intro into chemistry. Um, I hope that was helpful for you. I know this can be a challenging unit for some, so... 
um, please be sure to come see me in Help Lab if you have questions. Make sure you're updating your slide with all those guiding questions and notes. There were a lot of notes in this lesson. And then come see me in Help Lab if you need extra help or look for your flipped follow-up session in science. Have a great day.